right. Are we all set to go? No. There's a special guest coming. Hi. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> you will have to sit in the front row, however, now. <laughs> Come in. Voila. I think we have everybody now. Yes, perfect. Yes, the door is open now. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you officially to the kickoff of Malt in Belgium, the official launch event. I am Ilse and I will be your host this evening. And it's my pleasure to have such an uh, awesome and cool crowd in front of me. And I promise you, you won't regret the fact that you didn't choose to go and sit on a terrace with a nice drink, because <laughs> we really have a cool evening planned for you. And um, yeah, I think you will enjoy it a lot. Feel free to come in. But let's not deviate too long, uh, because we all want to go to the networking part uh, after this. So we're going to start with the, with the business part. And first up uh, will be Malik, who will tell you a bit about the agenda of this evening and about why Malt is the coolest freelance platform in the world. Uh, Malik and I, we go, <laughs> we go way back. I don't get a, get a commission, by the way. Eh? It's just I really like him. Um, so Malik and I, we go way back. Um, we met when I was working at Proximus and he was working at Vice. And we had a very good click and then we found each other again. And so I know Malik already a little bit, but maybe you don't. So let me introduce Malik to you. So Malik has an impressive track record in the agency and in the media world. He started off at Twitter, then he worked at Vice, then he went to Wonder Man, then to Mountain View Agency. But at the beginning of this year, he decided to move and to go to a place where his heart sinks. And so since January, he's the country manager of Malt Belgium. And he took up the challenge to bring Malt uh, from France to Belgium. But let me go a little bit beyond the typical LinkedIn bio, uh, because that's a little bit boring. So what makes Malik, Malik's heart beat faster is a football match of uh, FC Barcelona. And running after his kids also increases his heartbeat rate. I don't know if that's literally or figuratively speaking, both. And a fun fact as well about Malik is that once he received a personal message from uh, Jack Dorsey, Dorsey, the former CEO and co-founder of uh, Twitter, he didn't want to disclose with me what was said in that message. But maybe he will now <laughs> when he comes on stage. Oh, wow. So Malik, me on uh, we invite you to the stage. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, good evening all. Thank you uh, for being here, first of all. As uh, mentioned by Ilse, my name is Malik, and I'm the country manager of Malt in Belgium. Honestly, I was not expecting such a presentation. I felt like I was it was my marriage or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Where you know the bachelor are uh, uh, in making jokes about who's gonna the guy who's gonna marry, um, but again, uh, really happy to be here after five months actually uh, in the job, uh, and yeah, there were chances that I was not standing here in front of you actually uh, because when I was first offered uh, the position of joining uh, Malt as a country manager, my first reaction was to say thank you, but no thank you, <laughs> as Ilse mentioned it. Uh, I was actually about to become father for the second time. Uh, and uh, I already had a previous experience launching uh, a country in Belgium, launching such a business in Belgium. I knew how intense it was. I knew how the, how the workload was. I knew also how uh, uh, the kids would bring uh, extra uh, gray hair because it was uh, the, the second one. So I was kind of reluctant at the beginning, but I must say that um, I did my research back then and there was something that was keep coming back and that kept my mind running and, uh, and, 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 and flowing. Um, first of all, when I looked around me, I saw obviously uh, this massive trend of freelancing, uh, not only in the press, but also on LinkedIn. Also, I would say uh, from peers and so on, people becoming more and more freelancer. I was also noticing like how people were behaving very differently towards their um, work-life balance, professional expectations, all those kind of things in this period following COVID. I was also impressed by the Malt brand. 
I was also impressed by the people that you are going to see uh, later on, the leaders who are really promoting and having a very healthy discussion about what should the future of work be. And last but not least, um, the headhunter who uh, offered me, uh, the, the who presented to me the, the position, told me also something very, very important and very true in the end. Um, she told me, look, indeed it's a scale-up, indeed they are very ambitious, uh, you're going to work hard, but it's a very human company. And you'll see they want to build a business which is deeply locally rooted. And I must say that after five months, she didn't lie to me. Uh, I'm happy to be here. She's there, by the way. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Claire, again. Uh, and I must say that after five months uh, on the job, well, I, I'm super proud uh, to work for such a company because uh, those values really transpire throughout the company. Uh, we have really, uh, there is something, an energy that runs through the company where you know that you are doing the right thing for the right people and doing it the right way. Um, and yeah, um, it feels uh, it feels um, like it has been yesterday, and those, those last months uh, went went very quickly. And as I said, yeah, we are really happy to have you here uh, today to kind of give you more insights and a deeper understanding and a deeper view, I would say, on what actually um, this future of work means, what freelancing means. Um, and I hope that you'll get of this uh, session smarter than you were <laughs> before before joining. We have really. Um, I believe what is a very strong panel. So uh, thank you again for all the speakers who accepted to, 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 to be there today. Starting with Ilse, um, <coughs> that you just saw. Uh, and again, yeah, as she said, we go way back. And uh, I think Ilse uh, will give you a very interesting introduction to uh, her own background, her own parcours, and what it means to the broader discourse of freelancing uh, in, in general, followed by it Alex Fretti, our uh, managing director, who will give you, I would say, a deeper and higher view on the ambition of Malta in Europe. What do we want to play as a role? Where do we go? And so on. And next to Alex, I think we will have the, no offense, Ilse and Alex, but the most interesting part of the, <laughs> of the <laughs> session, which will be uh, the panel. Um, and yeah, experts in either freelancing or HR will really tell you uh, the challenges that they are facing on a daily basis, um, how hard it is to recruit. I was just discussing this with uh, somebody <laughs> uh, before before the event, and the role that freelancers can mean in this uh, in this whole discussion. And at the end, I will wrap up, uh, giving you maybe a more context about the local ambitions, the local vision, where do we go, um, figures, and so on and so on. But first, Ilse. Yes. There you go. Okay, yes. With pleasure. You can put the side. Yes. Hello again from my side. So when I met uh, Malik, I think it was somewhere beginning of this year, he did not only ask me to be the host of this uh, session, but also to give a keynote. Um, and I said, well, let me think about that. What could I tell? And he said, well, it's actually very simply simple. Just tell us your story, because that's what people want to hear. Uh, and that's what a, a, a lot of freelancers are going through, and, and it's really a journey. Um, so if that's okay for you, I would like to take you uh, into my personal story. Uh, that makes it a little bit vulnerable for me, but I feel here like as if we are in a very close uh, environment, so that will be cool. Um, so yeah, the title of the, the keynote is From Corporate Achiever to Purpose Driven Freelancer. Um, and I'm going to explain to you how that happened. It didn't go overnight. It was actually a very long uh, process. And it started already actually in my youth that probably there was a little bit of a spark there. And uh, what you see here is a, is a brain and a heart. And actually, um, I was lucky enough to be born with a big brain and a big heart. It's strange to say that as a Flemish person because we are very humble. But it is true, I have to, uh, I have to admit it. Uh, and what happened along the way is actually that those two got a little bit disconnected and I'm gonna explain you why. Um, and yeah, that starts actually in, in my youth. So I'm a, a daughter and a granddaughter of independent workers. Um, except for my mom, she was a nurse, she was the caring one, the empathic one, but all of the rest of the family was like, work, 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 don't look back, don't take a break and just go. So that was my imprint, and that is what I learned uh, ever since I was little. And I also learned that we don't complain, and uh, we just go on. 
I see some people nodding, so I think there's people with the same imprint here in the room. And what actually, uh, during my youth, I already had a very broad interest. I was going like to the music school, to the youth movement. I did theater, I went dancing, I did volleyball and so on. So I already had a very broad interest. And that is something that also kept coming in, uh, in, in my career afterwards, that I don't like to be put in one thing, but that I really like to explore things uh, diversely. Um, so, and that is what happened pretty much until my 18th. And then I went to uh, university here in Brussels. I studied commercial engineering. Um, but then, yeah, there was a bit of a, a, a thunder uh, and lightning struck in my life. My, my dad passed away when I was 18 years old. Um, he was my mentor, so that was really like a hard thing for me. And uh, that was in my first year at university. And he was the one that I always related to, but unfortunately he wasn't, he wasn't there anymore. Um, I still love him to pieces uh, till today, and I know that he's here as well today. So, uh, but then what did I do? I actually learned myself a su survival mechanism to um, suppress my heart with my head. Just to not feel the pain and just go, 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 study, work, and so on. And that's where the disconnect between the two happens, unfortunately. Uh, so then I continued in my studies. Uh, I had a lot of fun there, and what, what I liked about commercial engineering was that it was really broad, so again, that diversity. And then I had to pick a first job, and I saw a management traineeship at Proximus. And I was thinking, uh, first of all, I find that quite a cool mission because they connect people, and I want to connect people as well. So that's cool. But then this management traineeship, it allows you to go to all different areas and test do I like marketing or sales or business development or whatever? So I started at Proximus and I had a lot of fun there, but I also worked a lot, like really a lot, um, evening, weekends. And that paid off in a certain sense because uh, I made promotion after promotion after promotion, uh, becoming fast a team manager, um, working on all the strategic projects, um, having bigger budgets the whole time. Uh, so. Yeah, and because that was something that I learned also in my youth, that it was good to work and that, that love was in some sense a bit connected to achieving, I just kept achieving and going. So I was a corporate achiever. Uh, and I don't want to, yeah, it was a good period and I didn't realize at that moment that I was <laughs> overachieving. Um, but still, it was, it, was a, it was a good period. But then, um, like I think five or six years ago, um, I, yeah, I hit a wall. Uh, luckily enough, I had already a coach since eight years from now, I think. A uh, really cool lady from, uh, from the Netherlands. And I came to her and I had a session with her, a coaching session, and I actually, I, I crumbled down. And she said, well, now you're gonna stop and I'm gonna put you on top of a mountain in Italy to resource, which I did. Uh, which was very strange in the beginning, like to be in some sort of like bubble, a retreat bubble uh, and to slow down because I had always been like high pace, high pace. But slowing down actually does a lot to you. And it's uh, something that I can advise to everybody. We're gonna let somebody in, have a seat, no problem. So yeah, I was sitting there on my mountain in Italy and what happened there uh, after a couple of days, because the first days I was still like adrenaline shocked, um, I found my heart back there. And I understood that I had a survival mechanism of suppressing my heart with my head. And I also understood that I had very unhealthy working habits and that I wanted to change something uh, about that. Which was uh, exactly the mindset that uh, I came back with from Italy. And I really started to change my life. And there were some good things there um, because, yeah, I started new hobbies. Uh, I started to, uh, to play the piano. Um, I started to study traditional Chinese medicine. I had always wanted to be a doctor, but for some reason that didn't happen. And I just wanted to know something more about medicine, but not the traditional medicine. So it was Chinese medicine. But it also brought me in some difficult phases in my life because it was the finding back, back my heart meant that I um, that my relationship ended and I went to a went through a divorce so again a bit of an uh, an interesting period for me but the good thing about the whole situation was that I found my heart back and when I started to listen to my heart actually um, there were a lot of reflections going on and I was like okay I'm 33 
Apparently it's called the Christ year. That, that is a year where you start to ask yourself questions. So I ask myself questions. Um, is this being a grown up? Am I gonna work like this until I'm 67? Uh, does this make me happy? Uh, what do I want in life? And, and what do I stand for? And what is my why? And uh, all of those questions actually yeah, started to, to create a bit of a process and I wasn't even aware that that process was happening, but it was. Uh, and at that moment I was like, okay, um, I'm gonna explore that, but I'm gonna do that aside. I'm still gonna work at Proximus. Um, and at Proximus probably they saw also that my, my balance was better because instead of uh, like having to uh, overachieve and work, work, work like crazy, I managed to find a better balance for myself and to still have impact, uh, probably even more impact than when I worked that hard before. And so again, I got promoted. And then I had the lovely Jordi in my team. Um, I was responsible for the digital and marketing B2C of, of Proximus, a team of around 100 people. And it's then that I realized that I had a huge passion for leadership, for agile, the new ways of working, and for emotional intelligence. And it started like this, this passion, this spark inside started to, to pull more and more. And I was like, ah, oh, I want to do something with that. Um, and uh, yeah, at that moment, I, I, was, yeah, I was really exploring and I was a bit looking for the golden egg. What will be the next big thing or the company that I will launch? And actually soon after that, I realized that, it, that, that it's not a golden egg, egg that you have to look for, but that you have to find your, your true north or your ikigai, as we call it. Um, and what accelerated that process for me was the corona period. I think a lot of us asked ourselves questions uh, in this period, especially uh, if you were one of the lucky ones that was behind your PC from eight in the morning until six in the evening, not even having time to do a bio break. Well, that's the period where I also said, well, this is crazy, crazy. And then another thing happened was that I had a, a very big knee accident. Unfortunately, I don't know even the words in, in, in English, but I, I broke my meniscus and I broke my cross ligaments. So I had to have surgery and so on, and I had to stay at home for three months, which was horror for me. So in the beginning, I had like a detox effects. Um, but on the other hand, it was also like a good period for me uh, because it made me realize on one hand that my team was such a strong machine that even when I was not there, it, w it just kept running. Uh, and they did it in a very human way as well. So it was not just like running, running, but also very, very human. Uh, Jordi, correct me if, uh, if, that's not, uh, if that's not true what I'm saying. And that also made me realize, well, as a leader, I have to be dispensable. If I would want to be indispensable, that's my ego that talks. And I don't want that. So the team was running and then I had the time to reflect. And I was thinking, ah, oh, what is my true north? What is my true north? And I actually found it. And, and there, as I said, there's a lot of combinations uh, or a lot of methodologies to find your true north. But for me, it was uh, actually a book that brought me to it. Uh, the Celestine Prof uh, Prophecy, if uh, somebody knows that. That says, well, actually, your mission in the world is the combination of the skills that you get from your father and the skills that you get from your mother. And my mother was the hard side, the carer, the nurse, the empathic. And my dad was the uh, philosopher, psychologist uh, that ended up coincidentally in the business world, but the big brain. Um, and then I realized, yes, this is my mission in the world. Um, I was confronted a lot um, at that moment that in the business world there was such an over-adoration for IQ, but that actually what makes the difference is the EQ part, the hard part. And there's no now, nowadays more and more studies about that as well that show that 80% of business success is linked to the psychology, to the hard side of things. So I said, that's it, that's my thing. And then also like from the sky came my name for my company, which was EQ Librium. So you hear in there, EQ from emotional intelligence and equilibrium from balance. I wanted to bring that balance. So, and then I was like, okay, now I have a job at Proximus, but I still already feel like I want to do some things, but I don't know exactly what I want to do. So I started experimenting. That's something that I like a lot, and it's something that I learned from the agile methodology to really go and test and learn. And that's what I did. So I did small missions next to my job, 
And because the team was so uh, independent at that moment as well, I was uh, able to have more normal working hours. And well, then in that period, I started to feel, hmm, there's something here. And there's a lot of people that proactively come to me. And it's like as if some sort of thing is aligning because I'm getting closer to my purpose. And um, then another big moment, which was uh, last summer, uh, there was a big reorganization at Proximus. So uh, we had the uh, Agile scale-up um, and all the executives had to um, reapply for their jobs and for new jobs. Very interesting phase, very interesting process, I would say. And it created a lot of anxiety uh, in, the, in the leadership community. And um, I had my big epiphany when at a certain moment they said to us, well, you can apply for uh, three jobs uh, max and you need to write a motivation letter for each and every one of them. And it was like at that moment that they said that, that there was like a thunderstruck where I said, oh my God, I can write those letters and probably I would have one of these jobs, but my heart wouldn't be in those motivation letters. It would be like my head that would be talking. And then I decided to be transparent and open. And I had uh, long and interesting discussions with our, with our exco, our executive committee. And we discussed several options and so on. But in the end, we found that it probably was best to leave each other in all friendship. And I'm very grateful for everything that I learned at, at Proximus and also the, the fact that they have let me go in such a, in such a nice way. Um, and at that moment, I knew, OK, this is for me a period where I want to chase my purpose. So really doing something with this head-heart connection and bringing more balance um, to the heart. I'm not done yet because then started my sabbatical period. Uh, that was beginning of this year. And I can admit to you that I failed completely in it <laughs> because that working imprint was still there. And there were like such nice opportunities coming on my path, thanks to Malik and other people. I'm like, yeah, I have to do this now because that opportunity will never be there again and so on. It's not true those opportunities are there the whole time. Um, but I really had to dissociate a bit from my, I think, work addiction, but also from my ego, right? Because before I got a lot of recognition at Proximus and then I was like, okay, now I'm on my own. I do have a mission, but uh, what happens now? And so actually the last five months I have been working on, on freelance projects, um, but I only chose the projects that made my heart beat faster and companies that have a very strong purpose. And that's what I found as well uh, here in Malta and that's why I'm here this evening. And um, actually it's, it's my last freelance mission before I really gonna take my sabbatical. Because in the meantime, I did a lot of uh, coaching I have a brilliant coach, she's Canadian, she's so funny. Uh, but she also um, uh, helped me realize why I was stuck in this like rat race and not, not getting away from that corporate achiever side. And so now, as of tomorrow, I will be uh, reading, traveling, sporting, um, having fun with friends and so on. So it's my pleasure to, to end with a bang here with you. Uh, and so looking back at all of this, actually, um, for me, it all started with one big question. What is my why? And I found for myself that my why is to bring more emotional intelligence in the world and in the, in the business world. And I'm sure that I'm going to continue with this. And probably it will be in a freelance mode because then I think I can have more impact and I can have more diverse projects. And um, now I'm going to take some rest, but it's to jump further afterwards. Uh, they say in French, French uh, reculer pour mieux sauter. That's what I'm going to do the next couple, of, uh, next couple of months. And then I'm going to kick in uh, wholeheartedly. And yeah, so actually everything started with this one question. And as I said before, I kind of like experiments. So I would like to do a little experiment with you. I would like to take one minute of silence. And it's not to com com commemorate, some, uh, commemorate somebody, <laughs> but just to give you one minute of time to take a deep, deep breath. You can close your eyes, you don't have to. But just take one minute for yourself. And it doesn't have to be in a freelance role or a company role or whatever, it doesn't matter. But ask yourself the question, what is your why? And the time starts now. now. 
So have a bit of a reflection. All right. I think that was about 60 seconds. Thank you for participating in my uh, life experiment. I hope it installed in some sort of way a grain and probably you won't have had an epiphany as <gasps> I know my why now. But maybe this question will now be in your mind more frequently. And maybe this evening before you go to bed or maybe tomorrow morning, <coughs> you will ask that question. And uh, I'm really convinced that if we find a job that is close to our why, that we all can have so much more impact. And that's what I wish for you. So uh, please take this question with you. And uh, I wish nothing but the best for you on that journey. Thank you for that. So now that we had a, a glimpse of our why, I would like to propose to you to go to the next topic. And for that, I uh, invite Alexandre Fretti uh, to the stage. Apparently, Fretti is an Italian name. <laughs> That's what I learned. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Alexandre. Uh, Alexandre originally started his career at uh, Deloitte and McKinsey before moving to the scale-up scene and the startup scene as managing director of uh, WebHelp, but also as angel investor. And since two years, he's now the managing director of Malt International. But Alexander is more than that. What makes his heart beat is winning as a team and the excitement of a uh, big event. So I think this evening, uh, is a great evening for you and that your heart okay. beats faster. <laughs> Perfect. Achieve with the heart. Mm. Perfect. And what hardly anyone knows is that Alexandra has a big link to Kim Kardashian. He is born the same year, the same month, and the same day as Kim Kardashian. Please give a warm welcome to Alexandra, <laughs> who will tell us more about <laughs> the European vision. Thank you, Ilse. Thank you. Sorry for my fun fact. It's not so fun, but uh, <laughs> it's something easy for me. Um, uh, so you can uh, conclude on my age, uh, with the age of Kim Kardashian. Um, very happy to be uh, to be with you uh, today. Uh, thanks uh, all of you for being there. Honestly, uh, with the sun, uh, we were a bit skeptical uh, this afternoon. Uh, so thank you for the clients, the prospects, the partners, uh, the future clients. Uh, Ilse for this amazing introduction. It's difficult to go just after you. If I knew the, what you was doing, maybe uh, I would have asked Malik to, to go after, you know? <laughs> uh, he started saying, I'm not the most important part of the evening, and then you, 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 you did a big show. Uh, no, I won't be too long, but uh, I'm here to, to share with you two things. I will tell you a bit of the story of Malt in a nutshell, and uh, I will try to explain a bit why Belgium is very important for us, even if uh, Malik will do uh, better than me uh, afterwards. And sometimes a short video is better than a long speech, so we have prepared a, prepared a, a video to, uh, to explain the topics of, uh, of today, and I will let uh, Clément just start the video. Work. Work has seen some definitive revolutions in the past, but it's been a while since we've seen a change. People are hungry for a new way to work. Agility, innovation, impact, choice. That's what they're searching for. Whether they know it or not, people and companies are hungry for freelance. We are at the front line of a new work revolution, digital and human. At Malt, we believe in this new work order, where we can work the way we want to, with the people we want to. Choice is an incredible thing. It gives us flexibility, freedom, that's why we've built the strongest freelance marketplace in Europe. We've created a world of opportunity where freelancing is simple and secure, as it should be. Our job doesn't stop there. It's about making easier, better choices, connecting with the right person every time, raising the bar on teamwork, showing people the outside-in way to succeed in digital transformation. Freelancers bring in talent, clever thinking, and new perspectives, Choice, the new work order. So it's, it's a summary of what we are doing and what we, are, we will talk about uh, this evening. Um, we are a marketplace connecting the best talent in the markets and uh, the companies, small, mid-sized, large corporates, 
and we will, I will talk uh, on that uh, a bit later. Uh, but maybe to start with, sorry for that, but a technical uh, slide uh, about the definition, because when we talk about freelancer, honestly, and, and, and I had the discussion with some of you uh, just before, uh, what we are talking about, what is the market of freelancers? And it's complicated to define the market of freelancing because there is no formal definition, there is no legal definition. We know what is an independent, we don't know what is a freelancer. So a freelancer, what is a freelancer? It's somebody who is self-employed, providing professional services in a non-regulated uh, environment. So if we want to look at the freelancing market throughout Europe, we are obliged to start with the independent market, so on the left part of the slide, and then subtract the other categories of independence. So in, uh, in Europe, you have, uh, you have 15 million of independents. So if you want to go to the fifth, from the 15 to the number of freelancers, you need first to subtract uh, the guys from the primary sectors, so the farmers, the builders. Then you need to subtract the guys we talked uh, a lot about, which are the guys from the mobility, the gig economy, Uber drivers, etc. And then you have to subtract the regulated uh, professions. And so you arrive to the ore market, which is 6 million people in Europe, uh, growing uh, more than 15% a year. And, and we've put on that slide the different categories of freelancers. In average, if you, if you look at those uh, um, uh, categories of freelancers, you have 15% of the workers are in Europe uh, who are freelancers. So 15% of people uh, working in tech, data, arts, design, marketing, communication, business services, support functions are freelancers today. And for sure, this 15% will become 20, 25, 30, and I will explain uh, you uh, just after a while. Um, so the story of Malt in a nutshell. So Malt is a company uh, who has been, uh, which has been uh, created in two, so 2014. Um, we are now uh, more than 450 people. Um, the origin of the company uh, was based with two main pillars. First being company, uh, being a community first. What does it mean? Today I think it's obvious, you know, the, in the world of talents, the strongest part is the talent and not even the company. Uh, nine years ago, it was pioneering, saying, okay, we want to build a marketplace where the strongest part is not the client, but the talent. Um, and the second uh, uh, big pillar of the, 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 the birth of the company is being product first. Uh, Malt has a strong product, which is able to manage 100% of the value chain uh, when you have a relationship with a talent, or when you are a talent and you want to find uh, a client. So you have on that side the, the main figures of the company, in blue, uh, the size of the community. So we are here now in, in 2022. The community right now is there at uh, 350,000 uh, independent uh, consultants. Our uh, turnover will be uh, close to uh, 400 million euros in uh, 2022. Uh, we have started in France, we are French, but we have opened first uh, Spain in 2017, then Germany in 2019, and uh, we opened opening uh, so Belgium and Netherlands in uh, 2022 and, and, and I will uh, come back after why it's so important to be in those countries and so our main challenge is to become the the, the main uh, you know player on the field in Europe on the freelancing market and if you look at, uh, at uh, what has happened in another industry in the B2C it's exactly what is happening in the working environment 15 years ago we all discovered the benefit from the sharing economy uh, today you own less and less your car, your flat, etc. And we came from a possession economy to a usage economy. What is happening in the working environment? It's exactly the same. We are going from a possession economy, and the permanent contract is a kind of possession economy, it's a social possession, to a more usage economy, and the usage economy is the freelancing. On the B2C, it led to uh, the emergence of amazing worldwide players like Uber, Airbnb, etc. And in the working environment, we hope it will, uh, lead to, uh, it will lead to uh, uh, the emergence of uh, amazing worldwide player. And we hope it's going to be Malt and not the US guys who will take that seat. Uh, so 2022 for us, it's a really great milestone uh, for two main reasons. So first, uh, we announced already the, the opening in, in Belgium. So I like the, the, the journalists who, who talked about uh, Airbnb of freelancers. It's a good way to summarize what we are. For one good reason, our founder, Vincent, uh, was uh, really uh, in love with Airbnb when he launched uh, Malt. So that's why you, you will find on Malt a, a kind of s some similarities with uh, UX on Malt and the UX on Airbnb. 
And for the, for the, 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 the fun fact, um, when the, the guys from Airbnb uh, came the first time in France to launch the country, so for sure they didn't want to stay at the hotel, so they put a message on Facebook saying, uh, is there somebody uh, to host us? And Vincent was the guy saying, yes, I will host you. So he hosted uh, Brian Chesky and his uh, co-founders in Paris. And, and, and the story is quite funny because we like the similarities we have with Airbnb in a way. It's simple. Uh, you can really understand how it works and how we digitalize all the value chain. And the other reason why 2022 is very important is the fact that we announced uh, two months ago that we uh, acquired another company. We are, we are humble, but we are today the leader in Europe. If you just look at the size of the company, the number of the, the people in the community, but we need to remain humble because we are a leader with only uh, four countries and, and, and not a footprint that is uh, uh, so broad. And we, uh, we discussed with those guys, Comatch, who was, I think, the, 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 who was the best company in Europe on the premium segment of independent consultants. So at Comatch, you can find guys coming from McKinsey, BCG, uh, interim managers, guys above 1,000 euro a day, above 2,000 euro a day. And on Malt, we, you can find every kind of freelancers, but a bit less uh, that uh, premium segment. So the, the combined offer will be quite powerful because when we um, discuss with the corporate and with the procurement uh, team, the idea of having Malt uh, plugged to the company is to say, okay, we are a kind of one-stop shop for every kind of freelancers, every kind of talents. On Malt, you can find today HR, uh, finance, of course, digital talents, uh, but uh, now uh, some guys coming from the, the strategic uh, industry. So the combined offer is quite powerful. They are German, we are French, uh, so clearly it's a good starting point when you want to be strong in, uh, in Europe. So today, uh, 360 uh, independent consultant, uh, consultants, uh, 450 FT, so 30, uh, 330 for Malt, 120 for Comatch. And uh, our objective is to reach 1 billion uh, by uh, 2024. It was the plan when I joined the company. Uh, we are just on the plan right now. Uh, we still have a lot to do. We need to, to reach 50 million in Belgium by uh, 2024 to reach uh, that target. So you, you can see that Belgium will contribute uh, to this 1 billion. Um, and, and Netherlands as well. So 10% of the, of, the, of the business of Malt in 2024 will be done in the, in the Benelux. We are working uh, for small companies, mid-size and corporates. Uh, why? Because when we ask the freelancers, they say, okay, I'm really happy to have a six months mission with a CAC 40 clients with a Bell 20 tomorrow. But we are also happy to work with a company next to my house uh, where, the, where there is a sense of purpose. Coming back to the, to the, the intro of Ilse, it's something we see in the freelancing world now connecting to the heart more than the brain. And, and lots of freelancers become freelancers be, because of that, I think. And it's clearly something very important. That's why on Malt you can work with small businesses, mid-size and corporates. But honestly, our blue ocean is on the corporate uh, world. Uh, we are seeing the fact that uh, when I, I, I met, uh, when I meet the first time a corporate, I always have two questions. The first one is, okay, how many freelancers uh, are in the organization? Uh, the 100% of the cases answer, we don't know. Uh, and, uh, and the second question is, okay, if you have to rebuild your company right now, uh, would you rebuild the same way it's built right now? And the 100% of the cases, they say no. Uh, we would build with more flexibility, with more expertise, etc. I was uh, last week with um, the global HR director of L'Oréal, so uh, the, the, at the COMEX level, and he told us, I think it's a modern way of seeing the, the war of talent, he said, I don't care about the, the contract between uh, my company and the talent. I just want to have the best. So if the best are independent or if they are permanent contracts, I don't care. I just want to have the best. And it's the way uh, I, I manage my company uh, today. So we are working in every kind of industry. We've put a focus, but Malik will we, we'll talk uh, a bit later, on, on Belgium. So um, even if we didn't have any presence in Belgium, we were already working with some Belgium clients. One of our best clients historically is Ontex, so former uh, Bell 20 uh, company. Uh, they are digital factories in Paris, so that's why we were working with them. So already some uh, good uh, traction. Uh, and before launching the country, we already had uh, 100, 100 freelancers working uh, uh, for uh, Belgium clients. So hello. <laughs> it's, uh, it's impressive. It's, uh, you, are, you are coming for the panel maybe. Uh, I don't know, that's why they, they listened to Malik a bit earlier. To, they know the best part will be just after me. Um, so yeah, Belgium is a priority for Malt. Uh, some figures. Um, 
if you look at Belgium plus Netherlands, honestly, it's much more mature than France. Uh, the market is bigger than France, so you know that the, the, the size of the population is weaker, but if you look at the size of the freelancing market, Belgium plus Netherlands is 50 billion, France is 40 billion. So clearly for us, uh, it's very interesting markets. Uh, already, uh, so 100 uh, Belgium freelancers uh, have worked through Malt before launching the country. Uh, if we just look at the figures we have today on the platform, we have people of, uh, with an average experience of nine years. And, and you can see this maturity uh, on the last uh, figure uh, because uh, the percentage of freelancers compared to the active population is 3.5 in Belgium and it's only 2% in France. So clearly, uh, more than happy to be uh, with you today. Uh, thank you, Malik, for welcoming the, the Parisians. Uh, thank you for joining the company. Uh, not for saying that uh, the part is not very interesting when I take the mic. Uh, you are still in a trial period, I think. And um, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But that's the freedom. That's what we like. Maybe one last thing on that. And it's something we push quite often on, on our clients. Because when you work today with a traditional player, Calvinai, Accenture, whatever, if you work with them, and if you want to hire uh, a guy in that company as a client, first, it's impossible. Because in the contract, it said, OK, you can't. And if you can, you have to pay a hunter fee. So at Malt, we assume completely this uh, freedom of choice. And when you work with a freelancer on Malt, we assume completely that the freelancer can be hired by the client. So first, it's possible. Second, it's free. So for, for lots of our clients, we are thin a bit like a pre-hiring process. And if I take our own example uh, at Malt, uh, we are working with 100, of freelance, 100 freelancers a year, and we hire 10 of them. So it's clearly a, a way to think also a, a, a pre-hiring process and a new modern way of seeing the, the life. And clearly, we know that Malik uh, is happy today, and maybe if not happy tomorrow, maybe we'll become <laughs> freelancers. That, that's not what I expect, because honestly, we are really happy to have you on board now, and, and uh, I'm sure that we, we're going to succeed all together. So thank you all, and uh, I will let now the... Thank you, Alexandre. All right, it's time for some uh, interactivity now that we know what uh, the ambitions pla ambitious plans of Malt are. Uh, so next, uh, next on the agenda is our panel discussion. We have had some interesting discussions on the title of uh, this uh, discussion um, because uh, we were going to name it uh, how to win the war on talent in the beginning. But uh, at Malt, we really love peace and we don't like war. So we changed the title uh, to how should independent workers be leveraged to address the shortage of talents. And I'm going to uh, invite later on uh, in a couple of minutes the, the other panel members. And I can already uh, tell to you that we have some big shots, so it will be interesting discussions. Um, good to know as well that you can also ask your questions if you have any. Um, there is a mic and Augustin. Uh, will be running around. Hey, he's sitting there. Uh, I'm going to give him the mic, maybe. That would make it easier for him. So uh, if you have a question, don't hesitate. Raise your hand, and then we can uh, try to integrate it in the process. But before um, we start with the panel, I would uh, like to... Uh, yes, thank you, Jenny, for that, uh, for that reminder. I would like to give you a couple of extra insights. And this is the first one. I don't know if any one of you had, uh, has already heard about the great resonation or the big shift. Well, actually, what happens in the United States in uh, yeah, the summer, fall 2021, uh, is that the US government started to see something very strange in their employment figures. And they saw that there was like a big trend of people resigning. And then they tried to look a little bit deeper, and, and there were some categories that were more linked to ad other um, uh, factors that we're not going to deep dive into. But they also saw that a part of this shift was linked to freelancers that were taking the leap. And what we assume today is that there is a link with the corona uh, epidemic or pandemic, um, in the sense that a lot of people were asking themselves their, the questions that I was asking myself. And we see that ever since, actually, indeed, there are more people that are starting to choose for this um, uh, freelance approach. And we see that it comes more and more as well in the generations of the uh, millennials and Gen Z, because those people, and I think that's my assumption, um, they all saw their parents working like crazy, 
and they're saying, I want a different life. And we don't want to scare you here for the people that work in a, in a, in a big corporate, to be very sure. We just want to give you like a heads up that there is something coming and that we have to keep our eyes open for that. And the good thing and the bad thing about Belgium is that we're always lagging behind a bit. But in this, this sense, it's good because now we can steal with pride and look at other countries what is happening and start to prepare ourselves. So this should not be like a threat and you shouldn't see it as something like, <gasps> uh, everybody's gonna uh, resign at my company. No, just start to think differently about sourcing people, about getting talents. Uh, and that's what I wanted to say with this. Before going to uh, some figures, uh, interesting to know as well, you all got this paper. So there's uh, very little uh, research material on freelancing. Um, and Malt did a big research with uh, BCG and will continue to do so. And there's here are some figures from that, and then you have more figures on the paper that you got. So main motivations to choose for freelancing. Uh, and the number one reason that people give is freedom. People want freedom to choose the projects that they want, uh, the freedom to spend the, their time as they want, the companies that they want to work for. Uh, they want a better work-life balance, more diversity. There's one keyword to, rec uh, to remember, that is freedom. And we see that across Europe, so it's not something that comes in some countries and not in, not in others. And another interesting fact as well is that it's not something that they try and then they say, oh my God, this is a heavy thing to do. I'm gonna go back to a normal corporate job. Only 1% of the freelancers is looking for an opportunity to be employed in a permanent position. So there's a whole bunch of people there, very talented people, very motivated people, that aren't interested in the types of jobs that normal <coughs> HR services would offer. So again, uh, a request or, or an opportunity to open our minds. So those were the figures, and now I would like to invite our panel to the stage. Have a seat, you will be closely together. <laughs> Corona is over, so, well, I, I hope at least. <laughs> ah, yes. Yeah, the <laughs> you, can, you can move the table a bit if that makes it easier for you, uh, Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, let me present our panel to you. First of all, we have Christopher Franska. Global Head of Digital Technology Transformation and Enablement at Solve. I didn't know that one by heart. It was too hard to recall that. Christopher is a big sports fanatic and he likes to travel. And the thing that he likes most about traveling is that when he's on a plane, there is no connection. And that's actually the only time in his life that he feels like completely free of worry and uh, without distraction. Next, we have Patrick, who is Senior HR Freelancer and currently head of HR and people transformation at a big retail company. Patrick <laughs> is passionate about judo, Belgian beers and cooking. And his funny twist is that he only reads books that include, I repeat, swords, elves, wizards, dwarves, dwarves axes, axes wizards. knights, <laughs> stra strange books, strange books. <laughs> Sophie van Emeren, the lady uh, at the table, uh, is HR and people lead at telecom operator Mobile Vikings. But she combines this with her role as an uh, HR executive consultant uh, for the Proximus Group. And the Proximus Group has recently bought uh, Mobile Vikings, so uh, that's now she's, she's diversifying as well. What makes Sophie's heart beat faster is everything that has to do with people. So as HR and people lead, she definitely chose the right job. And also interesting to know is, especially for the Flemish audience, is uh, that people might recognize Sophie from television because she won, together with her brother, one of the uh, episodes of one of the most famous quizzes in Belgium, in Flanders, which is the Pappenheimers. And last but not least, we have Quentin de Bavelaar. Uh, <laughs> I thought that I had to say his name in a very strange French way, but apparently he has sti roots. So he has some Flemish blood there. So it's the Bavelare, as we say it in Dutch. 
Quentin uh, is general manager of Northern Europe uh, at Malt, and uh, he is completely in love with his uh, daughter of four months old, which is not a surprise, of course. <laughs> but what nobody knows is that it's actually Quentin that introduced the karaoke culture at Malt, even though he is a very bad singer. <coughs> His favorite karaoke songs are the hits of the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's our panel. Good evening, panel, and happy to have you here. Let's kick off uh, immediately, and of course, we start with the ladies. Sophie, I hear that at Mobile Vikings, you work already quite uh, often with freelancers. Why should a company start working with freelancers? Well, my, my answer was already given by uh, the CEO of L'Oreal, apparently. The we always go look for the right people for the right job, independent of the type of contract that uh, those people uh, want, require or ask for. Um, so we put our vacancies open to, uh, to everybody and just during the process we figure out in what kind of contract will we, uh, will we hire uh, people. And it just extends our market share of possible uh, candidates for, uh, for vacancies. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That sounds interesting indeed, but I, I suppose as well, uh, Christopher, that it's not always a walk in a park to work with freelancers. What are the, the main challenges that you find in working with freelancers? Uh, I think first, I think that's also why Malt uh, has some success, is to find the freelancers where they are. Uh, you cannot just put, uh, you, you can use maybe traditional ways of, of, of trying to find them, but uh, this will probably not work out. It's also how to set, so it's a big group, so how to set the right processes also in place, I would say, to work with more, more flexibility. I think not all the bigger corporations have this in, in, in their DNA, or it's also kind of new, new trends of how to, to evolve. I think as well, this also for, uh, in, in Europe, but also if you take it more broadly, uh, different legislations. Mm -hmm. And on the legal side, and certain things you can do in France, you cannot do in, in Belgium. The way how to manage people as well is, is different. So uh, as well there, it's, I would say it's, uh, so it's finding people. It's also the internal culture. And then it's also then how the legal side of it, how to manage it. We'll come back to that legal part uh, later on, because that uh, intrigues me a bit. I want to hear more about that. I haven't discovered that myself yet, so I might, be, uh, might get inspired there. Uh, so uh, Patrick. This working with freelancers, is this something that only big corporations like Solvec can do or, or, or not? And, and for what type of roles is it interesting? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I used to work for uh, you know, a company of 2,000 people, but I use also to work for a company of 135 people. The difference is you're not full time. You know, there is a big trend here in uh, what we call the shared HR services. When you are, you know, the HR manager for a small company for Monday for one company, Tuesday for another one, it doesn't work well, and that can only be if you're independent. You cannot do that in a, in a traditional contract. It works well. Then it's also a question of fee. But if you, if you work one day for your daily fee per week, it's affordable for a small company. It's not the case if you if you have your your daily fee and you are, you know, uh, billing 20, 22 days uh, a month. And that works, that's well received, and there is a big trend with, with the new uh, entrepreneur, I would say, and say, you know, I, I want to have somebody who help me with HR because it's important. As you said, heart, as you said, people, it's important that I need somebody, but I can afford somebody full time. Okay, so it actually opens a new world of opportunities, like it brings talent that maybe you couldn't afford as a smaller company. Uh, but as you only hire that talent for one or, or, or a couple of days, yep. you can still have that skill, but not pay like the, the full amount. Okay, cool. We already touched upon it a little bit before, but uh, one of the myths that I hear about freelancing is that there might be some legal concerns. Quentin, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Is it a myth, myth or is it a reality? I think it depends very much on the country. Um, and uh, else you are lucky because in uh, Belgium uh, there's very little risk for companies to hire freelancers. Uh, if a freelancer has uh, two invoices from different clients in a year, uh, the risk is almost zero. Almost. It's always. It's never zero. Uh, but some other countries are less lucky. Um, Spain, for example, and the UK are quite uh, tough, especially uh, recently. In the UK they introduced a new law last year called the IR35 to target specifically fake bogus freelancers. I would say Netherlands, um, uh, France, and Germany are um, orange, uh, gray. 
uh, but Belgium is really a, a kind of a paradise uh, for freelancers. <laughs> uh, that's why it's uh, so, uh, so well uh, developed. Uh, we saw in, in the slides uh, in terms of percentage of active population working as freelancer is pretty high. Uh, there's also a lot of managers uh, in, uh, in Belgium who are working as freelancers. Uh, Malik uh, is one of them. Good case in point. Um, so no, I think... Uh okay. So the risk is not zero. We can never say zero. But I'm it not is to say zero, and then some of you have an issue. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's okay. uh, very, very limited here in Belgium. Okay. okay, cool. Good to hear that. Maybe a quick check with the audience. Is there already anybody that has a question or wants to ask some more clarification on one of the things that we already discussed? No? All right, then we continue. Uh, Christopher, one area in which it's particularly difficult to find talents is in the tech and the IT roles. Are there some tips and tricks that you can share with us on how to find good people there? It has, has already been said, and I think it's a purpose. I think it was even you. I think you need as a company, and also before the, the session, okay, we can go for culture, we can go for nice management talks, but at the end, why people go for a company at the end is they wake up because they say there is a sense of purpose. I work, my, my work is doing that. So I think as a company, we need to find first, uh, if it's not fine, we need to at least to, to find it, to put it on paper, to find the right words and say, uh, say in IT or in digital, why should you, uh, I can take the example for survey, why should you go as an IT guy working for survey or not going for Google or not going for this company or this company, really trying to say, okay, which are the things that can attract, can, uh, can help. And, and I would say, of course, this is different for everyone. So you will probably not attract everyone, but you will attract people that have, I would say, a sense of purpose. And if you have also a sense of purpose, by de facto, in the beginning, you have also more an engagement. So I think it's also, I think, bringing also added value for any, right, and it will have a company culture, et cetera, et cetera. So I think everything starts from, for purpose, and uh, that's what it needs to be visible on also on the market, in the marketplace. Seems as if we aligned on the mes message, but we didn't, but I agree with you. Patrick, is there something that you want to add in this context, like how to find those difficult roles, what you can do uh, there, tips and tricks for the audience? Yeah. The, the difficult roles is, is you know, f first of all, what, 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 a, what is important for me is, is probably, you know, how, how do you organize the fit between the company and, and the, the freelancers? It's on values, that's clear. It's also on missions, in the interesting for the missions, the difficulty for the missions. For me, for example, if it's too simple, that doesn't interest me. I'm sorry about that, but I don't like that. <laughs> it has to be difficult. If it's not difficult, no way. That's probably, pr probably uh, uh, one way. Another way is, you know, is, is, is playing open. Y you have to play open with your own employees, pl play open with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the freelancers. In other words, you know, uh, they, they are people that are working for you. They're probably they are delivering. Uh, sometimes they are maybe they are delivering more because they have, you know, different, uh, uh, different competencies or different abilities. And, and use, it as, as, as use it as you said you want to use it at the beginning of the mission. There is nothing more horrible than you know being hired as a freelancer for this mission I know you will be the HR manager of the company and you do recruiting all the time that's that's something that's important and that's the way it will fit and do not forget that that probably for a freelancer is very easy to get out you know it's we are we are not in all these this legislation you know it's habitually in my contract it's four weeks that not in four weeks I say ciao bye bye ciao les frères merci d'être venu I'm getting out then yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. On the fit and on working with freelancers. Cool. Um, Sophie, what I, what I saw in my Proximus time was that uh, more and more business teams were open and asking for working with freelancers, but sometimes it blocked a bit at HR and procurement. Are HR and procurement ready, both in terms of mindset and tools, to answer this uh, freelance move? I of course cannot question, answer that question for all of the companies, uh, so I'll uh, I'll talk from uh, from my side, um, and I do think they're ready. But I also uh, recognize the sentence uh, in the introduction that if you go to companies and you ask how many freelancers are there, some just actually have no clue how many freelancers there are. So uh, I think it is important that everybody in the company is recognized by. HR or procurement altogether, and of course there's another way of contracting them, uh, but you should have a clear view of how many people are there here, how are they uh, in the teams, uh, independent from, uh, from their yeah. contracts. And I do see that in the more bigger companies, HR and procurement are not working together and they are seen as totally different populations in a company. Mm -hmm. 
whereas at Mobile Vikings, I'm responsible for all of them, independent from their uh, yeah, yeah. from their contracts. And I think that is important to have yeah. a good view on your total uh, talent management and not only on your yeah. uh, permanent uh, hires. And if I'm informed correctly, I think at Mobile Vikings, it's even the case that you first look for a fit, a people fit, and then the contract discussion actually comes way later. And then it can be or you choose freelancer or you choose a, choose a fixed employee, right? Yeah. Is that correct? And also it can change in the course of your okay, employment. Cool. Well, it can change in the way from um, freelancer to fixed. For now, yeah. we don't yeah. allow people <coughs> to go from fixed to freelance in the same role because that is a legal boundary that is still a, a, a little bit of risk. Uh, but yeah, we are open to that type of discussion okay. during the selection process. Okay. We first look for the Viking DNA and then we look for the fit with okay. the role and then uh, the type yeah. of contract we will hire people. And on. then maybe one more question on that topic because it, I think it's interesting for, for the people here uh, in, in the room. How do you do that concretely then? Do you have like, I don't know, comparison tables on, on fees or how does that work? Yeah, we made um, on our different pay scales, uh, you have the gross salary and then a, co a comparison to uh, a daily fee okay. uh, that compares to that. Okay, cool. All right, that helps. I think uh, that can inspire a lot of people from uh, uh, HR or procurement here. Um, Patrick, I can imagine that there are, oh, oh yeah, I, I, I make, uh, I scare <laughs> you or something. No, no, but I, I'm just asking, you know, hey, total cash or total rent? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> when you do the comparison, no, I'm kidding. Well, we take everything together, yeah. yeah. So total rent. Yes. Okay. Total RAR, indeed. So the total sal salary, right? Yeah. Patrick, I can imagine that there are also some companies that fail to get the most out of their freelance workers. Could you give us some advice on what uh, companies can do to really make good use of the freelancers that they hire? Well, I think that, you know, consider, uh, as you do, in, in consider the people as a resources. You, you, you need somebody, it doesn't matter how, how, how you organize the things behind, you need somebody, and you have to be very, very drastic in the selection process of a freelancer as you are very, very drastic in the process of, of uh, I would say, uh, a permanent worker. Why? Because these people can work in your company. I had mission for close to three years. Three years is enormous. You know, it's enormous, the, the, you know, how you have to, to, to manage it. That, for me, is very important. And again, transparency. Transparency, you know, be transparent. You say if you say you want to go for HR manager, be an HR manager. Yeah. If something change, <laughs> courage and honesty on both parts to say it doesn't fit anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, my heart is not in, in <laughs> with my, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm serious by being, sen and then, then, you know, be being honest, having an open discussion and, you know, find a way to make sure that you, c you can, you can separate both of them, you know, in, in the, in the right way, in, in, in other words, in the right way, you know what, in a way where you can eventually collaborate five years later yeah. again. That's the way it is, and, and that's for me the, mo yeah. the, mo the most important. I agree with you, and I think that also like this briefing moment at the start is really crucial. Eh? If you miss that one, then you can really go against the wall uh, with, with freelancers. Um, maybe, uh, Kantai, another cliche that runs on the market <laughs> is that freelancers, I don't work with that because they are more expensive. Can you tell us something about that? Is that true or not? So I think <coughs> when, you, when you hire a freelancer, um, at uh, 500 euro per day, <coughs> and you hire an employee at uh, 60k per year, and you make the comparison month by month. 60k, it's uh, 5k per, uh, per month, and a freelancer at 500 euro per day, 20 days, it's 10k, so it's double the price. Uh, but when you take into account uh, social charges, when you take into account paid holidays, when you take into account office, uh, healthcare, uh, all types of benefits, uh, laptops, etc., etc., uh, you raise the bill of the employee quite a lot, uh, you don't realize it, but actually the gap is more 5 to 10% additional for a freelancer. Uh, personally, I think it's a very acceptable cost for agility uh, and to have someone in my team in, in six days and not waiting yeah, six yeah. months. Yeah, uh, and also yes. for, for expertise, right? May and maybe it's, it's temporary or certain skills that you need. So, uh, so yeah. that's the markup that you have to, uh, to yeah. take into account. For, the, for a fast uh, time to hire uh, and for flexibility and agility. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Thanks. Um, we also hear on the market sometimes, Sophie, that it's hard to integrate the freelancers in your company culture or in your teams. And um, well, I know that Mobile Vikings, uh, for the ones that know the company, 
uh, is a company with one of the strongest uh, corporate uh, DNAs that exists. You can be really fr proud of that. I think it's the case. Um, I can imagine yeah, that, that you guys really think about how do you integrate those freelancers or, or how do you approach that so that they really also live that DNA that you guys uh, stand for? Well, as said before, we hire them on that DNA. So also the selection process for a freelancer, we do check, do you fit with our company values and our company yeah. culture? Uh, so that check is already done. And then once they, they are on board, we just treat them exactly the same as everybody else. So they're invited to all <coughs> types of events. Um, for legal reasons, they are in the italic in our org chart, but uh, they are just there. They're part of the team. Um, uh, they uh, they get all of the same emails and information uh, sharing that uh, that we do. Um, so we hire them as Vikings yeah. and we treat them that way. Yeah. So we don't treat them differently or we don't exclude them from our personnel parties or no. Um, the only legal exception that we have is they are in our um, feedback tool or performance management tool uh, so that they can uh, receive feedback and give feedback, they're just not uh, in the official end of year process. Yeah. That's the okay. only uh, thing that they're left out, but all of the other uh, aspects, they're just uh, uh, counted in okay, for cool. as everybody else. And I think that's really like a role model role that you guys are taking up there, because I think that still a lot of companies indeed manage it as two separate things, and th then you have those idio idiot discussions where you say, ah, oh, should the freelancers be invited to uh, the, the team building and so on? It depends on how strong legal is in your company. Yeah, but if you probably, can yeah. work pr in a pra pra pragmatic way with it, um, yeah. Yeah, you can do quite okay. a lot and invite them just on everything. So yeah. I think you're really a good uh, role model there, Sophie, so maybe uh, if you want more tips. <laughs> There's some questions there, so uh, Augusta? The mic is coming because then you will be on the video as well. <laughs> All right, hello, everyone Jordi. can hear me. So uh, I'm Jordi, I work at Proximus. I keep the machine running now that <laughs> Ilse <laughs> is no longer among us and I work in a marketing and communication environment. I think it's interesting what you say to, to get the freelancer to adopt the culture of the company. I think at the same time, an added value of a freelancer is that he challenges the status quo. That's another way of thinking. And in a big corporate, I feel like sometimes we are forcing the freelancer into our own processes, mm -hmm. our own way of working, templates, whatever. Do you have any tips on how we can sort of balance this and keep <coughs> the spark, uh, the extra energy that a freelancer gives while still, you know, sort of working within a corporate such as Proximus or yeah. any other examples here in the mm. room, I suppose? Mm. Very good question. I can give you, I can you the point of view of the freelancer. And I will be very, very, very strong on that. As a freelancer, I'm not here to tell you what you want to hear. I'm here to tell you the truth, and sometimes the truth hurts. Then you have to do that dip diplomatically in the right way. You have to have your proof. You have to say it's not a, a feeling or whatever. But that's the way I'm, I'm, I'm known <laughs> as a freelancer in HR. And sometimes it can, it can be difficult. I have you know, some interesting discussion with some big boss. I used to work with Romain, and that's why I'm, I'm looking to Romain. Uh, when I said, no, we want to do that, because it doesn't make sense in the environment you are and in the, in the, the problems you are facing. It does not make sense. Don't, Don't do, do that. that. So it's a bit like the, the responsibility of the freelancer to keep that spark. Yep. Uh, but then on sometimes. the other hand, probably also, and maybe that's something that needs to be ch uh, checked also in the, in, the, in the beginning of the process, uh, probably also the company that withdraws a little bit or that there's an open communication on the fact that this challenge can be brought, right? Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's difficult. Yeah. So I think Jordi, if you added in your briefings and your recruitment process and you picked uh, <laughs> the <laughs> challenging uh, ones. Yeah, I, I think we're burning here to, to, to complete. <laughs> Aha, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Good question. No, I, I, I like what you said, but I will also maybe say, maybe nuance certain things. Depends mm -hmm. on the profile you look for. If you look for a developer, yeah. probably, or a project manager, I think it depends on that. You want the person in a certain way directly being fit in the, in, in the process, et cetera. I think if you are in a big transformation, or if you know that there are certain things that you want to have an odds in, in view, and having maybe company culture, if you have people that are 20 years in, in the same job, then bringing some people from outside as well to help to, to challenge, but that's also then the way how the freelance, I think, needs to be attentive. If he wants to go too fast, too hard, he will be pushed back. He will be really be rejected as well. So I think it's the the right chemistry to, to really feel, okay, we need to change, but what's the timing to change? What's the plan to change? And how to, to bring it? Otherwise, can be 
also one month this, on the other side we can also break one month the contract in the so Absolutely. It's, it's yeah, I agree. Okay. I strongly so agree uh, context is important uh, of and the context of the company yeah. yeah Sophie you also wanted yeah. to add something um, we we invented our uh, why on earth project to cover that um, and we <laughs> created a, a slack channel that every time one of our employees thinks why on earth are we doing this like that? We post that question in the Slack channel, uh, and the answer is because we used to, or we have always done that, can never be the right answer. So <coughs> we, we really encourage our employees to, if they get a question from outside or from one of our uh, users or, or, or Vikings, uh, or new starters indeed, though they still have that open view, like why on earth do you do yeah. that process? That we post it in there, we keep track, and we have somebody That's in cool. our company uh, keeping track of that and, uh, and taking those up as projects to see can we not do it differently? Or That's really cool. Yeah. But then actually, again, it's integrated in the total DNA. So again, yeah. the employees and the freelancers. Yeah. Both with of uh, them are discussing yeah. in that same okay. channel uh, mm. and giving input. Yeah. Oh, Jordi, I think you have a very complete answer. We have another question. Yeah. Hi. Ah, you have the mic already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much uh, to the speakers and the panel for your insights so far. Um, my name is Jonathan from Pfizer. And we were currently working and I had long-term missions with some malt developers. And one of the challenges we see is they see an awful lot from the corporate structure, the bonuses and the, the things that come out at the end of the year. What's your tips for managing that with when you have more longer term projects with freelancers to keep them feeling like they're skin in the game, that they feel like they're benefiting as well? Because I agree with the point Sophie made about bringing them in and having them part of the team for team building and all of that. But at the end of the year process, it's still a huge thing. Um, so how do we how do we mitigate for that? And then you're talking merit and bonus processes yeah, wise, exactly, or yeah. well, if we we don't have bonuses for our freelancers, uh, but uh, we do benchmark their daily fees. And if we indeed see you really made a, a huge growth in uh, in your role and in, in what you take up. We have that comparison table, so we can also adapt the daily fee uh, compared to that. But of course, it's not within the official merit process because that's indeed only for permit workers. But we do have that type of discussions as well with our freelancers. Yeah. It, it begins also, I have, I have already seen, I, I never did that, but I have already seen contracts where there is a variable, a variable piece of the contract, where variable piece on an objective, variable piece on you know an achievement, variable piece on something, and then you have your daily fee. It's 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 compared to particularly what what you can do in the market in the market of uh, you know permanent contract as well as as freelancer. But there is also really an objective or two objective and and an incentive on the objective achieved. It's not yet very popular uh, in uh, in Belgium, but uh, in Anglo-Saxon countries it becomes more and more and more and more uh, frequent. Yeah. Uh, contact on that. I think it's not about the money. Um, <coughs> people choose to become freelancer for freedom for choice to work on the project that interests them, that makes their heart beat. Um, and same thing for employees. You don't keep employees just with a bonus. Uh, employees leave also when they feel disconnected with the project of the company. Uh, <coughs> and just incentivi incentivizing people with money, you won't keep the best one. Uh, and they won't stay for the good reasons. So I think if you integrate them enough in the mission of the company, in the purpose, and what is the impact of their project, this is how you retain them as freelancers, same as uh, the best employees. Yeah, it, it, it's less about Money, more so the thing showing the recognition, recognition. for the yeah. goals and the achievement. Exactly, impact and, and purpose. Yeah. Mm. And I think it also brings a, a more philosophical question on uh, do we as companies still believe that merits and bonuses and so on are the right ways to uh, grasp the intrinsic motivation of our people, right? But that's something that we will discuss with a glass, not now. <laughs> we have uh, <laughs> it's a yeah, 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 indeed. Um, so one last question, unless there's still a question from the audience. Yes, then we can take one last question there. Just maybe one, my name is Alan Kamea, working at WC. I think you talk about the importance of making one team with the, the employee and the freelancers. Do you see a challenge growing with the permanent employee willing to become freelancer and more and more employee coming to you and saying, you know, I really want to be a freelancer because it's so cool. And how do you deal with that if this is a challenge? Just to start with, if you look at the numbers, um, there are not many freelancers yet. I mean, uh, they are, and we hear a lot about them, but still in numbers, they are still a minority compared to employees. 
<coughs> and being a freelancer, it's not just cool. You also, it also comes with responsibilities. As a freelancer, you are your own boss. You have to sell. You have to do your accounting. You have to do customer management. Uh, you have to do everything. You don't know exactly how much you will get at the end of the month uh, in terms of money. So there's also some financial uncertainty. So freelancing is for entrepreneurs. Not everyone is an entrepreneur. I'm an employee. I'm perfectly happy as an employee. Uh, and, and I think it's a, it's a balance. And for sure, people who are entrepreneurs, it's better to keep them as freelancers than to prevent them from leaving the company. I, I would t t totally agree that so we see also people, and it's, it's, it's also good to have people that say five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in a company because it brings as well some longevity. So I think that's also some people that do not want, and we see also some other, even a change in a company brings as well kind of a challenge to manage a change, to transform them, etc. So. I think there will be not, it, it, I agree, it's entrepreneur, maybe it's also maybe cultural, it's also maybe also the generation, the new generation maybe is more tended than the older generation. That's what I, 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 w I, would, I would add on that. Also maybe to mention, maybe that's also thinking, it's, uh, it depends also on the operating model of the companies. You have companies where, for example, management layer, it's internal, it's never an external or just for ad interim because you have a big change or someone is leaving. So if you want to make a career in a certain way and, and maybe being a corporate achiever, <laughs> but then maybe, <laughs> then maybe you, need to be, you need to be internal or you want to have, if you want to make an, a big impact in the way how to change the operating model, in the way how to, to act with the client or to build a strategy, you need to be internal. So it depends also on the company, the organization, the operating model of the company. Sometimes it's better to be a freelance, sometimes it's better to be internal. I think again, a very rich answer. Um, we're going to have to wrap up here. There is no miracle. There is no miracle. There is no miracle. You will still have you know, people who yeah. are dreaming to become yeah. independent, yeah. even if they are not in the right conditions to be. Yeah. yeah. Maybe to quickly. At Momo Vikings, indeed, we don't allow it. So staying in your same position, changing from permanent worker to freelancer, there's just a too big of a legal risk. Uh, but if, re if people indeed indicate that they want to become a freelancer, yeah, they can first go and be that entrepreneur that does that commercial talks as well and gets uh, assignments in. And it, it did happen that after two years, we hired them as a freelancer for a, for a specific uh, project. Uh, but just changing status in that direction, we don't, uh, we don't allow. Interesting. Thank you, Sophie, for that add-on. One last question for all of you. And please answer with uh, one word. <coughs> is this freelancing thing a temporary buzz or is it a trend here to stay? Buzz or trend? Christopher? Trend. Sophie? Trend. Quentin? Yeah, obviously, <laughs> trend. <laughs> <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> Patrick? Trends. All right. Give them a warm hand. All right, I think that was very interesting and thank you for your questions as well. That makes the session a lot more lively, so that's really cool. Um, we had buffer questions, with which we didn't need, of course. Um, so yeah, we, we have seen now that uh, this is a trend and it will be here to stay, but now probably you have some questions on how do I have to uh, take my first steps in this environment and so on? And, and what does this mean in Belgium? And how can Malt help me with that? And uh, Malik will uh, explain to you uh, that now. And uh, he's the last speaker and then I come back for the closing and then you can go and have a drink. Yes, because everyone is thirsty, right? Uh, and don't worry, I've asked uh, the catering to wait a bit. They, don't want they won't run with sandwiches and drinks. So, uh, but I will try to steal a bit of the last bit of energy that you have, two minutes, to give you maybe a more, more insight about, yes, what's the plan for Belgium? Uh, because we saw that Belgium uh, is a very mature uh, country uh, regarding um, freelancing. Um, and with that comes a certain responsibility. When you as a player say, OK, we are expert in freelancing, and we want really to uh, make sure that uh, these people, this population, uh, feel like uh, we are uh, we have their back, basically. Um, and to do that, we think that, yeah, simple, basic stuff. But the best way to do it is really to uh, act as much as possible as a local player. Um, we really want to be there uh, to uh, empower uh, the biggest or smaller companies and making sure that uh, we are their local body, their local partner, the enabler of their digital ambitions. So that's really uh, the purpose that drives the entire team here locally, that is growing and growing. Uh, so when I arrived, we were uh, two people. So uh, Christian uh, was uh, the uh, trailblazer uh, for Belgium 
Uh, he landed uh, in October and really opened uh, lots of doors uh, back then. I was the second one, and so far we are uh, seven people and still uh, onboarding uh, very, very quickly. But that's the idea, giving the local flavor to the, um, to, the, to the business, really making sure that we understand what matters locally for both companies and, and, and freelancers. And to do that, we bring, uh, as you saw also, um, a technology, a platform, a business, a service, that we want also to as much localize and give it this local flavor. We want the clients here uh, to be able uh, to, as I said, fulfill the digital ambition, whether it is uh, launching a new SaaS that will revolutionize Industry X, um, whether it is uh, like revamping um, uh, a very complicated CRM or just revamping your website. Yes, we do that uh, also, maybe more simple project like, uh, li like these ones. And we really want to create the place, an environment where both freelancers and company can in the most convenient way match and make sure that they complement each, uh, each other's needs. Um, but if you're still asking yourself after this one hour uh, discussion, why do those people keep insisting on independent workers? Uh, <laughs> Maybe I have one last argument uh, for you, which is this one, basically. Uh, on the left side, you have uh, a stat that shows that 83% <coughs> of hiring managers in Belgium are facing difficulties to recruit. We know that it's a very uh, common fact, even for us at times. Um, and we know that this, this process can take six to nine months. On the other side, what you have is a very skilled population people who are um, willing to uh, contribute positively to the local economy, willing to contribute positively to digital projects. And they represent actually 25% of professionals active in digital jobs. You might see a match there, right? <laughs> and yes, that's where we try to fill the gap. I mentioned a classical, um, I would say, uh, recruitment process takes ta six to nine months. On Malt, it will take six days, six open days, for you to get the right profile to actually uh, staff your projects, on average. Um, so speed is obviously uh, one very strong key element that we bring on the table. And you also do it, I think, in quite an efficient way. Efficient is a very broad word, uh, but what we mean by that is actually we are um, doing it in a win-win way, uh, in the most transparent way. If you go on MALD, you see the rates of freelancers. It's very transparent. You also have a team that understands their expectations. So our team will onboard uh, most of the freelancers that are, that are subscribing uh, and that will contribute to, to your project to make sure that there is this fit um, and that we actually make sure that there is this direct click in between the client and the, and, and the freelancer. Um, and lastly, we have also a model that is actually success-based, meaning that it's free. As I said, transparent is a very strong value uh, at Matt as something that we promote. So you can either as a freelancer or as a client subscribe on the platform for free um, and access to uh, this large community, which is now at 7,000 independent talents already. So we started at 3,000 uh, by the beginning of the year. So growing pretty fast, I must say, uh, spread all around Belgium. So um, it's not because you saw lots of French-speaking people today that uh, we <laughs> don't have also a footprint uh, in, in Flanders. No, we are really spread uh, in terms of a community uh, all, around, uh, all around Belgium, with 40% of these freelancers are experts. Um, and as you see also, uh, I've put lots of very fancy buzzwords uh, on the right side, right? Like. Uh, uh, Java, no, not so, not so fancy, right? Uh, Angular, uh, <laughs> Amazon Web Services expert, and so on. Uh, they are all in math. They are all in math. Um, and actually, uh, just keep in mind, if you have any need regarding your digital project, there is somebody with expertise who can help definitely help you on math. And the team is also here, spread uh, here around the room, to also help you fine tuning these these needs and making sure that you have the right person, you have the right fit with your company culture, etc., etc. Because it's not, not, it's, not, it's not only just a technology, we are also putting a human touch uh, behind it. And lastly, um, yeah, we had a very strong uh, start, but we believe that it's only the beginning. Uh, 
Ambition is the way, right? Uh, it's one of the key values uh, of Malt. I had to put it because uh, uh, otherwise <laughs> Alex won't be happy about me. Um, and the idea is really to, uh, yeah, to capitalize on this very mature market um, in Europe, an important market like Alexandre highlighted it. Um, and we are uh, ambitious, but I believe it's a healthy ambition. We are on track or even I won't say it too fast because otherwise Alex will raise my target for this year. But we are ahead of target uh, for this year already. And as I said, yes, it's ambitious to say we will be 40,000 freelancers by 2024 on Malt, have a business of 50 million. But I think it's a very healthy and realistic ambition taking into account uh, the market and the first signs that we saw. Being this one. Um, one of the first uh, main uh, successes that we were able to celebrate uh, and uh, we will further celebrate today. Um, we were happy to be uh, actually selected. Uh, one week ago we got the, the confirmation from the European Commission that we were one of the selected partners uh, that will work with them to kind of fulfill their digital needs uh, for the next uh, four years. Together we are partners uh, in this consortium. So Great news, but we believe that it's only the, the first step to a great story that we are uh, <coughs> kicking off today. So again, thank you all for being here. It means a lot to us. Um, and uh, um, I'm happy to continue uh, the discussion in a few minutes with a drink. My mouth is really uh, dry, <laughs> so and I guess yours must be as well. So uh, thank you again. I give you a thank you. I'm not going to take you long anymore, but I need to do some official stuff now. Huh? So we have had the formal part, and I hope that you all learned a lot of things uh, that you can take uh, back to your, to your offices and to your homes uh, this evening or tomorrow. And I would like to take the moment to, uh, to thank some people. Uh, first of all, the speakers for their interesting content, the panel members for their interactivity and their uh, strong and clear opinions and concrete tips. Jenny and Clément, I don't know where Clément is sitting, ah, yeah, for the overall coordination, thank you for that. Uh, the technical teams for the smooth delivery, Silver Square for the a little bit crazy but inspiring location. <laughs> and last but not least, of course, you um, as an audience. Uh, you have been a great audience and we, uh, we are really happy that we had some interaction with you and we hope to continue that with you. As a token of our gratitude, you will all receive a goodie bag, or you have received a goodie bag. If you haven't, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, and there will be some cool gifts in there, and you also have a paper with some more information on freelancing if you want. Uh, it would be cool as well if you like us and our speech and so on, to post something on social media that can help us to uh, grow and that can help Malik uh, to, to have a good year this year. Um, <laughs> please. Yeah, yeah, he has a, he has a bonus, so yeah. Please also note that the speakers and the panel members and myself that we will be available in uh, the drinking area as well. Uh, so come to us for any question, suggestion, possible project and so on. Just know that we are not bribable, so don't come with bottles of wine or something. We don't do bribes. Uh, another very important message before I leave you is on the toilets. Um, we have heard the message that it's hard to find the toilets here in the building and I have to confirm that that's true. So there's one option is to go back to the entrance close to the elevators. There there is a toilet option, but there's a better one as well. Jenny told me about it. <laughs> Behind the catering, like really in the corner, there's a special toilet area uh, themed in the erotic theme. I haven't looked yet, but for people that want to go and discover it, <laughs> it's really not a joke. I'm not even making a joke. So, uh, I think we're almost there. I would like to close off with a, with a little experiment again. It won't take long, but I'm going to ask you some questions. And the people that uh, want to answer to those questions uh, I do can stand up. So, every time I ask a question, and then if that question, the answer for you is I do, you stand up, right? Who amongst you already knows his or her why? You can stand up if you do. All right. Oh, a lot of people know their why. That's cool. <laughs> Whom of you is uh, you can stand you can continue to stand up. You don't have to go sitting again. Whom of you is already a freelancer? Oh, interesting. You can stand up uh, you can continue to stand up again. Whom of you considers becoming a freelancer? After this evening, you think, oh, if 
on my purpose. No, no, nobody. No. All right. Whom of you will look at hiring freelancers in his or her company? Mm, interesting. And then one last question. Whom of you is ready for the drink? Everybody. And you're all standing, so...